Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to another episode of Behind Closed Doors. This week we are talking about the things that are not being spoken about in the Muslim community, women. And with me I have my beautiful sister and my guest, Julie Siddiqui. Assalamualaikum sis. Waalaikum salam warahmatullahi Thank you for having me. Now, you know, um, alhamdulillah, you have been involved in our community for a while. You embraced in 1995, mashallah. And since then, I guess it's been a roller coaster. You haven't stopped, which is beautiful. Um, some of the things that you brought to us is you've done a lot of work with Jewish and Muslim interfaith relations. Uh, the big iftar, we all know. You've worked with the um, Islamic Society of Britain. <clears throat> You're the governor at two schools. And the list goes on. It's I, it's a beautiful um, background, really. But it's important because I think it shows your wealth of experience and knowledge of things that are happening behind closed doors. Um, I had the privilege of meeting you when I was a newborn in the media um, spiel when I was on the niqab uh, debate. I think it was the Oxford Union I met you. Right? Yeah, something. Uh, I think, yeah, 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 yeah. How did I? I was like, I seen you the other day. You was on Instagram, and you know, you were talking about the fact that obviously there was a masjid in your local area that had said that women couldn't access Darawi prayers, and you were upset about that. And of course, you know, I'm watching this video, but what really got me, and I wanted to cry when you said it, was you were like. 30 years you have remained silent you have bitten your tongue but now this is it you need to start speaking out and I think that's really what was like oh my god I've really got to get speaking to you because I've been there girl like I've been there got a teacher you know so um I'm gonna let you take 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 the minbar take the hub here's a microphone let's go <laughs> yeah, no, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Auzu billah min shaitan ar-Rajim. So look, I mean, thanks for having me, and I'm so glad that this series behind closed doors is happening because there's too much that's being spoken about behind closed doors or brushed onto the prayer mat, and you know it has to stop. And I think, having said all of that, I think the over my years of being involved in Muslim communities, never have I seen women, Muslim women, speak up, speak out, connect, support each other as much as I am seeing now. And I think that is a very positive development. I've got goosebumps, actually, as I'm saying that. Um, and I think that is where I've always felt this is where the change is going to come for our community, how we kind of progress and move forward in the right direction. And it's going to be women that start to talk about the stuff that we all know about, but no one has wanted to talk about out loud. Of course, it's difficult to talk about things out loud. But I really feel, and I was thinking about it again this morning, that I have got, you know, decades, literally two decades worth of women's stories on my shoulders. That's actually how I see it. And, you know, I've heard it all. I've seen stuff. I've been told stuff. I have bitten my tongue often. I have spoken out before, but the way I've done it this time is definitely more public, more specific, and I guess more determined, but it's because I have the stories of these women on my shoulders you know I'm not exaggerating when I say that and even since I did this video put it online people have messaged me from all over the country to reaffirm to tell me their story to say thank you for saying it you know to almost like breathe a sigh of relief that at last we can sort of talk about what we all know is happening no one wants to say it out loud and, you know, of course, it's not easy to talk about this stuff out loud. It's difficult, you know, public. And then, you know, things can be put out in places that you wouldn't want them to be or that you didn't plan to be. But one thing I do know is, especially with social media, is things only uh, go around in the way that this video has when it resonates. You can't fake that kind of stuff. You can't fake, you know, 13,000 views on Instagram. You can't fake just on my own Instagram. You can't fake the number of messages I've had. Like, we can't make that stuff up. Yeah. So, you know, in, in one way, yes, it's difficult. And of course, people, Muslims don't want to see a Muslim, you know, in a way, bad mouthing the Muslim community, because that's how some people have seen it or, or bringing the mosques into disrepute. But I say these are issues. And if we're honest, everyone knows they're happening. And, you know, unless we actually talk about what is going to change. And I think I've got to the point now, you've mentioned the interface stuff, you mentioned the 
social action and stuff. I've done all of that and I love it and I still will continue to do it. But about eight months ago or a year ago, or maybe a bit before that, I thought to myself, you know, what shall I focus on? I'm 50 this year. What's going to be my kind of next 10 years, I guess, of, of me? And what can I bring to the table? I'm, an, I'm a different person to how I was, you know, when I first became Muslim and when I did uh, women's stuff then. So I love the fact that actually, yes, if we go on to what are you doing now with that? And I noticed you've got um, a organization that you've put together. It's called Together We Thrive. OK, yeah. and it's a network online platform to train and inspire Muslim women to fully participate in society at every level and to challenge patriarchal attitudes in all communities and to ensure Muslim women are better represented in print and TV media. Okay, well done, mashallah, right? Because, look, can I yeah. say, right? Yeah. Why? Because when I did the niqab debate, I almost had a bird's eye view of how media intelligence operated, okay? So I see that, you know, even in that side alone, yes, Sisters do need empowering, you know. Mm. So I applaud you for doing this. Inshallah, this will be successful because I think what, you, what you've mentioned is that when sisters speak out, they can almost feel like they're going to get a backlash from somewhere, you know. Um, but we, in our experience, and I, I, I don't know, I can't compare my experience to yours and just talk about myself, but I found that actually there was no backlash, you know, because I guess what I was doing was so small, you know, and yes, the stories came in, sisters would reach out, thank you so much for doing this. So that's where I think it's important, you know. So could you talk a little bit about your journey, you know, because you, you for interfaith, for example, right, you are meeting other communities. And this is not about us outing the Muslim community, right? It's just the way that the dynamics of a community, how huh? every community has their issues, right? Mm -hmm. So how have you been able to, you know what I mean, bring that into Together We, we Thrive? I just want to touch on it. I don't want to, you know what I mean? Because I don't want to rush you through that. Yeah, yeah. no, look, so um, I, I started my community journey in Slough, which is where I still live, and set up a Muslim women's group here back in the late 90s to early 2000s and chaired it for 10 years and learned a lot and loved it. And I still feel very nostalgic and all of that when I think about all of the stuff that we did and the social stuff and the friends and many of whom I'm still in touch with now, you know, it's amazing. I got to a point where I thought, I don't really know what else I can do with this and I need to develop myself as well. And I got involved in other things. One of the most empowering things for me, I would say probably in the last 10 years, has been working with women of other faiths and Muslim women, of course. And the reason I say it is because, you know, one thing you realize very quickly when you start to make friendships and build a bit of trust with women of other faiths, Jewish, Christian, etc., is that the stuff around gender, sexuality, you know, how women are perceived, actually there's a lot of commonality in the bad stuff, <laughs> in the difficult stuff. You know, I remember the Archbishop of Canterbury himself once saying to me, at an event, I asked a question, it was awkward, you know, there, was, there were Jews, Christians, Muslims there. And he came up to me afterwards and because he, he knew that the answer had been fudged as well a bit. He didn't answer it, someone else did. So he came up to me and he said, look, you know, if anyone tries to tell you that we as Christians <laughs> have got this whole gender stuff sorted out, then they're not telling the truth because 2000 years later is what he said, we're still where we are now, we've got a long way to go. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those kind of conversations with people like him, but also especially with women, Jewish Orthodox women and others who are challenging essentially the patriarchy and saying, we ain't doing this anymore. We need change. And as women, we can do it. Now, I found that really eye opening, quite moving at times, if I'm honest with you, because it's like, whoa, I remember being at an event. Everyone was speaking. We we're all kind of on the same page. And I thought, gosh, I felt quite emotional because I thought, oh my gosh, they are like me. You know, they're women like me who are feeling the same stuff. So I found that stuff to be really powerful and it's taught me a lot. It's opened my eyes a lot more. Um, and I think that in a way I've brought those experiences, you know, we're all the sum of everything we've done and all the people we've met, right? Mm -hmm. So I really am feeling that now. Now I'm older. Um, 
sometimes wiser, sometimes not. And, you know, I've learned a lot and still got loads to learn, made all sorts of mistakes. I think I've got to the point now where I thought, okay, I want to now bring some of that learning and a lot of me into, in a way, back into the quite specifically Muslim space, even though I will be and still am working with and doing work with people from all sorts of backgrounds, my focus, my passion, my drive is now on this stuff with Muslim women. And mm -hmm. rightly, as you said, not just on the sort of the really difficult stuff, i.e., you know, stopping women from praying in a mosque, but that's a big thing for me. But the stuff around building women as people, how do we get Muslim women to discover themselves earlier on in life than a lot of them do? Because a lot of the time, women in general and Muslim women with their own specific stuff going on in the community, often give everything to everybody else, hit 50 or 55 and think, oh my gosh, I've had no life of my own. You know, I don't want people to feel like that. I want people to be able to be fully themselves, develop that confidence, while also, of course, having family, <laughs> looking after others, etc. So for me, that's what Together We Thrive is about. I love the word thrive, but the together bit for me is really important because one thing I've noticed and where I've identified a gap kind of nationally with Muslim women is we're not connected enough together. And you know, the, 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 the network bit, the bit that needs people to be connected, to have support, the sisterhood, when people are going through difficult things, when people have got things they wanna celebrate, how do we do that better together? So the together bit is really important. And I guess as well, just to finish off, the, the other part of the together will be the interfaith element. So women of different faith doing stuff with us to help us all thrive. And also, of course, working with men. You know, this isn't an anti-man campaign. Actually, for a lot of what we're talking about and a lot of what I see, men need to absolutely step up and get much more involved. And, you know, we're ready for that, right? We're not saying it's a women thing. It's about where are the male allies? Why have they not done more, frankly, on some of the issues that are behind closed doors? And how can we work with them to move it forward? Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, what, when you when you're talking about that, I think when women do come together, and you know, and, I, and I'm working with with an organisation currently, you know, where I see sisters come together, I see that there are elements of building, you know, first building their confidence, and then preparing them, right? Preparing them for achieving what they want and you know yes it is important to point out that although you do have you know the misogynistic um men you know that have taken um their version of islam you know and are doing it there are actually brothers out there that are working in groups that mashallah have a good you know understanding of how it is to be in islam you know and they're ready to help sisters you know get onto a pedestal so um now, what I wanted to say and what, what I want to add to that is that in my experience, when I was doing my own media stuff, people were like, I found that non-Muslims, right? And this is where I actually realized that working with non-Muslims is beneficial to me, would come to me and they would quote ayats from the Quran. They had, they had studied Arabic and they would like... You know, I really like the way you articulate yourself about wearing the niqab. And, and did you know that? Da, 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 da. These people were giving me dawa, you know. Mm -hmm. And I felt that what happened was, was there was this almost like an, a Europha, uh, euphoria that took over me. And I was like, oh, my God, Islam is really easy. Whereas the Islam that I was being exposed to was just so manufactured, you know. So... Have you seen this in your own journey? Yeah, well, funny enough, you don't know this, but literally today I had did an interview with my local BBC about this mosque issue. They picked it up from somewhere and I've spoken to them before, so they know me. So he was asking me, the presenter, Andrew, his name is, shout out to Andrew, and he was asking me um, about things. And then he said, let me just ask you something, Julie. Am I right? I think I'm right in saying that Islam is more equal when it comes to gender, men and women, than other religions. And if that is the case, then what's gone wrong? So I was kind of taken aback, but in a, in a good way. Yeah. And then I thanked him and I said, you know, thanks for asking in that way, because it's powerful. You know, when he said that, that's more powerful to his 
Berkshire listeners <laughs> than it, me saying it, right? Mm. So that has come from someone who will have spoken to and met and tried to understand his broad base of listeners, which will include Muslims, when he's hearing a story here and a story there, and then meeting people like you and me and thinking, this doesn't add up. Like, mm -hmm. it can't be the religion. If Why would the, are these women choosing it if it's so unequal or unfair against women or oppressive to women? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that is a great example of where, we, you know, of course, there are allies. You know, I've been working with someone else. In fact, she's also doing some writing on this issue for the BBC. She's being so careful so generous with her time, so particular about making sure that she gets it right. You know, those kinds of things people often don't see and think that the media is out to get Muslims. Look, of course there is Islamophobia, anti-Muslim hatred. Of course there are horrible, ugly stereotypes that we know are not true. We know all of it, right? But the point is, don't tar everyone with the same brush, just like we as Muslim women or Muslims don't like being tarred with the same brush of terrorism or extremism or whatever. Of course we don't. So, you know, we can't do that to other people, too. And I think this idea that the media is all out to get us and that somehow if I speak on that media, whatever it is, I'm somehow bringing the Muslim community into dispute. I'm sorry. I was told that again today, by the way. I'm sorry. The way that men are behaving when it comes to abusing women and using the religion to do that, mm. or the way that men are behaving from saying, I can't come in and pray in a mosque, which is not their decision to make, it's God's house. Those people are bringing this religion into disrepute and making a mockery of the beautiful teachings of the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. So, that is bringing the religion into, I'm not by mm. speaking out. Of course, I know it's difficult for people to hear the truth. But don't try and then make out that this stuff is not happening because you don't want to hear it out loud. And you know what, Shalina, I've literally heard it all this week. And I think to my, I just have to keep going back to the root of why I have spoken, the stories I have on my shoulders from decades of women telling me what's going on in their lives and how they are being mistreated. There's beautiful examples of Muslim marriages. There are beautiful examples of men and women coexisting and working side by side there are amazing mosques in the uk doing the most fantastic work mm -hmm. of course me speaking out doesn't undo any of that stuff we celebrate that we talk about that we love that we do though need to talk about the ugly stuff unfortunately yeah. it's there as and, you that, know. and that's why i love that you've created together we, we try because of course like I said, you know, there is a point where the women can come to you. We can, you know, almost invest in them with their confidence, build them up. But then we can prepare them for going out there and, you know, sharing the, the beautiful Islam, you know, the Islam that we experience behind closed doors and that keeps us going, despite Islamophobia slapping us in the face, despite you know, men from our own local, local community slapping us in the face, right? So, um, and that, so how has that been for you then, you know, now that you're starting to step out there, do you have, um, you know, men from our community now coming and saying, actually, this is not what our Islam is about, and we want to prove that? You know, are they coming now and kind of helping you? Like, Julie, you're not, you're not on this on your own, you know, we're going to do it, we're with you, we're together. Yeah, look, I mean, I've worked with men all, all the way through all of the stuff that I've done and have met the most amazing people and feel very lucky, very grateful. Um, what I have found, and I think what I feel is a bit disappointing and still do feel this, but I see the change, is so many men will sit with me in, in, a, in a gathering or at my house or whatever with my husband and others, the pe kind of people we would hang out with. And we all know that this stuff is wrong. So the fact that there are, you know, one third or maybe more of mosques in Britain that don't have a space for women to even pray in, let alone the ones that have the space and are in the basement, behind the bins, round the corner, no speaker, right, all that stuff. So you're probably talking about at least half of the mosques where you either don't have space for women to pray or the space is utterly inadequate and totally unacceptable. I mean, that is probably the reality of what we're talking about. No one has the actual data yet. That's part of the work that I am working with others on. But that's the reality. Now, that is, a not, that is not our faith. And that is not how we as British Muslims feeling connected to our faith 
as women or men should accept things. Mm. Now, what have men who also know that is wrong, what have they actually done to call that out, to use what I would consider male power, because it's there, to go to the mosques that are doing that and say, this is not right. And I'm not going to come to this mosque anymore until you sort this out. Not enough of them, let's say it politely, have done that. And that for me is wrong. Now, what's happened is I made a video, and at, which was five minutes long, right? Where I specifically called out the issue, yes, connected with Ramadan. And yes, there's a connection to my own mosque, of course. And I felt upset. I felt angry. And I waited until I calmed down. I told the mosque I was going to speak publicly about it if they didn't change it. They didn't reach out to me. I did what I said I was going to do. So I didn't do anything wrong in that sense. Yeah. I did a five minute video, but it was from right from here. It was from my heart, but it was also from those years and years of people saying to me in private, behind closed doors, that I've been treated like this, or this person did that, or I've been told I can't do that, or I've just been told we're not going to be able to go and pray. And I've, you know, I'm done with it being private. Mm -hmm. So I said it out loud. And at the end of the video, I specifically said at the camera, I am talking to my Muslim brothers here too. You have to step up. Now, yeah. some people who I've known for a very long time did step up and contact me and were as upset and disgusted as me at the general issue in the way that I had laid it out, not about my mosque, not about COVID, not about Ramadan, about the big issue, and said to me, what can I do? You know, so those are the kind of responses that I wanted, frankly, because I want them to be stirred by it and realise, OK, there is a lot more I can do on this. Now, when and we that's, talk what's, about, that's what's happened. When we talk about what can be done, right, we have um, the famous hadith, if you want to know uh, a community, then look at the women, right? Let's look at the women, uh, domestic violence, financial abuse, you know, um, single mothers, the divorce rate is high, you know, mental health, you know, the list goes on. And for me, you know, the kutbas are the perfect opportunity for these things to be addressed. Just like our sisters need schooling and preparing for the likes of Islamophobia and, you know, um, how to actually practice their, their deen, how to look for the right husband nowadays because of the level of narcissism. You know, I say that the good ones are actually that point. And, I, and I'm raising this because I hope that, you know, those that ever do, you know, watch this video are like, OK, we're going to start doing this, you know, because I understand that that's how Prophet Muhammad used to address, you know, the ummah is if there was an issue, you know, it would get raised. We know that sisters need help, you know. So many sisters are leaving the deen. So many sisters are leaving Islam, right? And I'm like, subhanAllah. And they're like, Shalina, I'll understand if you don't want to speak to me. I'm like, what? No, no, no. I'm still going to speak to you because I've still got a connection with you, you know. And I allow them to go on their journeys. But... Have you have you noticed, do you feel the same about the fact that one of the solutions could be the kutbah? Yeah, for sure. I mean, look, there's a huge potential. And definitely, if you look back at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, you're right in saying that it, it was addressing the needs of the day, right? And so, you know, for, to be able to sit and listen to that must have been amazing because it was the place to be in that sense, right? And And importantly, no one was excluded from that place. And everyone was part of it. And women could stand up and ask a question. You know, it's like unrecognizable now to what I see. So even in the better mosques, let's say it like that, in this country, I don't think there are really any where the women could actually stand up and say, I, I, don't, I don't agree, or can you just clarify, like directly, that, that we just haven't developed that culture, but that was all there. And those examples are very clear. Mm. And, you know, do not prevent women coming to the masjid very clear he was very clear about that yeah. and the stuff then around which is where i think more education is needed and more clarity and more discussion is the is the uh, uh, hadith that is much more unclear but is used all the time which says prayer for women is better at home those things have been taken out of context yes he did say it peace be upon him what did he mean why did he say we need to clarify that because there's no way it was meant as an oppression to women and there's no way that it was meant to close the door on women and to stop them from benefiting from exactly what you've just said the other part of what he said which was to listen to the khutbah 
you know, there will be people, mosques in this country on Eid this year again, where women won't be praying Eid prayers, right? And so you start to think, hang on, where's the mismatch? And this hadith about do not prevent women coming to the masjid is very clear and totally agreed upon, totally mm. authentic. And yet others will conveniently talk about it and then let it slip so they can talk about the other stuff. And for me, there's a whole thing there about education. And I want people to really try and put themselves in the shoes of being a woman in those times. Of course, it's not Saudi Arabia 1400 years ago. We're living in Britain in 2020. I'm in 2021. I'm in Slough. It's very different, right? But you can take the principles, which is what we all try and do all the time. So if we're saying that we're following the Sunda, where's that Sunda? Because I'm not, I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it. I'm not feeling it, you know. I was speaking yeah. to some people the other day and I started crying. I started crying when I spoke about the prophet, peace be upon him. It really, I wasn't expecting to, but the reason I started crying was because I was remembering and thinking about all this stuff that I keep seeing about honoring the prophet. Don't talk to me about honoring the prophet when you're shouting and screaming with a megaphone. That's not honoring the prophet. You know, talk to me about how we as community, women, men, young people can work together and really genuinely honour the prophet, peace be upon him, and not don't make it all about that. And if I am told as a Muslim woman, I go to a shop and I'm told you can't come in because you're a Muslim or a woman or both, there'd be uproar. Mm -hmm. And Muslim men would be talking about Islamophobia and they'd be saying boycott that shop and don't go to this place and find out the address of the owners and go and stand outside their house with their big loud hailers talking about Islamophobia because a Muslim woman hasn't been able to go into a shop. I go to a mosque and I'm told you're not coming in because you're a Muslim woman and you, there's no space for you here. No one does anything. That for me is, is totally out of balance of where it should be. That's what I want people to think about and address much more. And I think when you say about getting upset about when we think about Prophet Muhammad, you know, for me, um, the last sermon is what always hits it for me because, you know, it was so apparent that Prophet Muhammad knew the direction that a people would naturally take, you know, and making sure that women were on there, making sure that there was no um, prejudice when it came to who you were, whether you, whether you were Arab, whether you were black, you know, it's there, subhanAllah. And, you know, for us to see it, and I guess because we're actually out there on the front line, you know, we see it because we hear not only the sisters coming to us, but the, the sisters that are raising the children with the mental health issues, so then not only do the the sisters have mental health issues, the children then have mental health issues because, you know, brothers are having children and then um, divorcing the women, not providing for the children and going off and getting married and doing it all again. Yeah, exactly. Honestly. You know, and um, subhanAllah, like it's just enough is enough, you know, and um, inshallah, maybe things are changing and I pray that we can do that. So, Ending on a much stronger, you know, um, note, you've also co-founded Open Mind Mosque. Hmm. What is that? Yeah, so look, I mean, it's all part of what I'm talking about now. So we started it actually on the back of what was, you know, in a way we chose the name deliberately because the MCB at that time had started Visit My Mosque. And while I'm a, a fan of that stuff, right, I've been talking about that as well for a long time. Mm -hmm open up bring people in do work with people of different faiths let people see the mosque is not a hotbed of terrorism and we're not making bombs you know it's a beautiful place bring people in that's the only way that they're gonna break down those stereotypes i totally love it i agree with it but there is another part of it which i think i would say the mcb and other bodies haven't done enough to address certainly up to that point is this whole issue around there are mosques that don't even allow us in so it's all very well to talk about you know opening mosques up for everyone else so that's why we called it Open My Mosque as a kind of tongue in cheek response. So yeah. It's not to say it was bad what they're doing, but actually there needs to be so much more on this stuff. So we started it off and started gathering the stories and we've sort of let it rumble on and people have been contacting and we've done some various different talks. And it's mainly myself and one other person, Anna Naya, give her a shout out for doing such amazing stuff and sticking alongside me for all of these uh, years. So we've kept that going and actually, you know, it's been 
brilliant. And what, what our plan was actually to do much more on this stuff June onwards, sort of after Ramadan. That was already my plan. Mm -hmm. Got a few things in the pipeline and stuff happening. And then this mosque issue happened to me personally. And I felt like it was a moment. And also I felt upset. You know, I felt upset. So I spoke about it. And, you know, the, the, the response and the stories and the people saying, right, well, you're right. We can't allow this to keep on happening. And let's talk about it has happened so open my mosque in a way is what i'm talking about and that kind of campaign element that sort of education finding out you know there are different schools of thought around the whole conversation about mosques there are some groups of people you know some groups in in muslim communities who think that women absolutely shouldn't don't need to come to the mosque and so we have to you know figure out what that what that's about and how do we manage all of that when there are you know legitimate differences of opinion opinion and how do we do things differently and what's the education so I'm excited you know in some ways I'm excited for what I think is going to come you know none of this stuff is easy to talk about I wish we didn't have to have these conversations about our religion basically being misused against us as women but that's the reality right that's why we're talking about stuff behind that's normally behind closed doors so I've never seen a wave of interest of people wanting to get involved women in, mainly uh, as I have right now so mm -hmm. I, I know that we're on to something. It feels like the time is right to talk more about this stuff and lots of different things are sort of joining up. I didn't plan it to happen, you know, to me locally. That wasn't my plan at all for my last week of my life. But, you know, I, I've taken it at, to think to myself, OK, let's talk. Let's do this. Mm -hmm. This isn't about battling men and women. This isn't about me dissing the mosques. You know, if I wanted to do that, I could have done it 20 years ago. You know, it's not about that. I took my Shahada in that same mosque, by the way. So mm -hmm. I have a deep connection, of course, with the mosque and have tried and worked with them and all of that over the years. And some of it's worked well and some of it hasn't. I just think don't use COVID and health and safety to stop women coming from the, to the mosque. Because that's what's happening, not just in I mine, but in lots of others around the country. What was important, sorry, but was that the government themselves and other faiths like churches and mm -hmm. whatnot, you know, if they're making room for women to enter these establishments. And we know how massive our masjids are. Yes. We know what we're dealing with, you know. What is this? Oh, you just can't be bothered to manage or crowd manage or what, you know. And subhanAllah, like when we look at hadith about visiting the sick and we actually look at how we behave around sick people, you know, and the wakal and all of that, you know, it, it's quite comical really because um, the people, the brothers that are making that, that, decision appear really weak and I think you know the community or sisters need an explanation don't just say you can't come in because of xyz well okay here's our solution now that we've combated that that isn't good enough so what now what now you know and it's I'm interesting just... because and these things can be complex and of course in my own mosque case here lo locally and this is happening this is a live story that we're talking about right now for me um there are women involved in the mosque. It does have a space. There are women volunteers. And in fact, though, some of those women volunteers, not by name, but just as a group, have come forward to say, actually, we were consulted and we didn't think there was enough space. And I just feel, OK, <laughs> that's very interesting because many of the women that have messaged me to say we would have volunteered to take people's temperatures. We would have made sure that everything was orderly and health and safety was was abided by because it's important to all of us. Women don't contract or spread COVID any quicker than men. So to have a blanket men, women ban thing, you, you know, it's very difficult to justify it to me, especially in a large place where there is a lot of space, lots of doors. Of course, it means extra effort, but the effort has been put in for the men to go. Like if they were saying no one's coming, that would be very different for me. But to and make all of the effort for men and have not even any women, I said 220 spaces, then give us 50 then. Yeah. If, if you can't do half, half, then fine. Give us 50. At least I will feel satisfied that some yeah. women who honestly people have said to me, I feel so disappointed and let down that I'm not even going to be able to give them a chance. I've had a really tough year through COVID looking after everyone. I needed to be able to go and listen to the Quran to be with other women and to just pray on my own, not in my own house. Yeah. That is what we're talking about here. I mean, honestly, it's so obvious to me, but, but then, but then, as you said, unfortunately, um, we're not in that position where women, all women 
can just do that. I mean, there are some women, unfortunately, that, you know, don't have the kind of husbands that are like, how are you, my dear? You know, how do you feel about this, my dear? You know, no, I'm the man of the house. And this is what I think. So everyone must follow suit. You know, yeah. there's no there's no reasoning and stuff. So uh, imagine the difficulty a lot of women have been through in the last year. And I'm not saying that all of those who've been through difficulties can go to the mosque. But some of those women that would have prayed at that mosque really needed it. That's the reality. And I, I feel really that we've been let down like that. It's been that. one really hell do. of a year. But um, really difficult. But a beautiful anyway, to be continued and watch this space, yeah. A beautiful <laughs> ending, I think. Yeah, because you know, at the end of the day, you haven't been defeated, Julie. And uh mashallah, you know, you're using uh your knowledge, your wealth of experience to, like you said, now invest it into something that can make a difference. And I think everyone that's been on this circuit gets to that point, you know, and that's why. You know, I'm so grateful for Muslim Women's Network for actually yeah, absolutely. doing behind closed doors because they have obviously um, their helpline, you know, where they have information coming in and they see this, you know, yeah, they, exactly some of the horror stories they get. They're doing a great job, you know, and there's very few platforms like this and with people like that. So, you know, I also am very grateful and I think, you know, l long may it continue really because this is what we need. Yes, definitely. Well, Jazakallah khair, and we will be sure to put all of your links at the bottom um, so that people can join you. So just to clarify, Together We Strive is not just for Muslims. I mean, look, it's mainly focused on Muslim women. So togetherwethrive.co.uk explains it on there. I want to mainly focus on Muslim women, but I don't want to shut the door on working with women of other faiths because it's inspired me somewhat the most in the last 10 years. So that's really part, a really big part of me and important. So, but it's for me, my mission for the next 10 years or so really is going to be a lot of this stuff focused on and, Muslim and women. And sometimes other faiths have established, um, you know, better frameworks. Of course, so, we can learn um, a lot, you know, we can, yeah. and they can learn a lot from us too. And you speak to anyone, they will say they love hanging out with Muslim women because, you know, we can share and learn and grow and develop without compromising our religion. <laughs> I feel yeah. more uplifted if I'm with women, Jewish women, for example, who are talking to me about their learning and their texts. And this. it's fascinating and brilliant. I don't feel like I want to move away from my faith. I feel more connected to God when I am with people like that. Mm -hmm. That's really important. So just allow it to enrich and develop us as people. And we can, you know, really go much further. I think we don't need to be so insular as Muslims. Open up. People want us to open up. We need them in our lives and we all mutually benefit. Yeah. And Thank you so much. Just to be successful. <laughs> inshallah, with, uh, inshallah. Our endeavors, inshallah. I mean, just Thank you so much. Sis, really. Take okay, care. Okay, and enjoy the rest of your Ramadan. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah.